morning. It's good to see everyone. Welcome. Um, first, I want to welcome all our visitors. Um, uh, we like to thank Brother Hutchinson for coming back. It's good to see him again. Um, so we want to make sure we, we want you to know that we're glad they've chosen to come to worship with us today. Uh, we believe in speaking where the Bible speaks, being silent where the Bible is silent. If you have a question, we will, we will be glad to give you a Bible answer for a Bible question. So at this time, we want to encourage everyone to uh, please silence your cell phones at this time. Um, we understand that the mandate has been lifted for COVID, but we do encourage to wear masks. And I understand we do have masks and hand sanitizer available in the foyer. Um, when it comes to offerings, uh, if you would like to have your offerings tracked for tax purposes, we are asking that you use the envelopes for offerings and please fill them out, you know, put as much information as you can. Uh, we also we are also set up for those who would like to make their offerings via Cash App. Um, so this week's uh, scripture memory verse will be from Matthew 5, verse 44 through 45. Um, the sick and shut in, we want to uh, keep Sister Paula in our prayers, Brother Ger Gerald and Sister Julie. Um, we want to pray for the family of our brother, uh, Robert Ahuna, who we lost uh, during this week. He has transitioned on to be with the Lord, but we want to pray for his family at this time and also just pray for the congregation. Um, he was here for a very long time and served, so definitely want to uh, keep him in prayer. He would definitely be missed for sure. Uh, prayers for those who have been affected by the recent storms in the South. Um, Mention again, Brother Gerald and Julie Evans um, for recovery. Uh, brother and Sister uh, Williams for Virgie, Shawnee health issues for Derek and those in the military for the stress in their lives associated with the war in Ukraine and the Myers family dealing with their grief. I want to pray for Brother and Sister Vega for a wife and family of co-worker who recently passed. And then we also just want to keep those in Ukraine, um, keep them in prayer, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ over there. Um, we just hope that the war will end soon. And just pray for the churches as a whole, you know, and pray for everyone. Just pray for the world and the leaders up top. All right. That's all I got. Any other announcements? No? All right. I'll turn it over to uh, Brother Jimmy. He'll lead us in opening prayer. Sure, pray. Dear Heavenly Fathers, once again, dear Lord, we come to you as humble as we know how, dear Lord. Just thank you, dear Lord, for allowing us to wake up to see another day, dear Lord. Just giving us the opportunity on this first day of the week to come out and worship you in spirit and in truth, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we ask for any forgive, we ask for forgiveness of the sins we may have committed against you, dear Lord. We so thank you, dear Lord, for your grace and mercy on us, dear Lord. You won't hold the sins on us no more with our true repentance. Dear Lord, our hearts are heavy, dear Lord, by the, the, the sorrowful news of the passing of our dear brother, Robert Anuna, dear Lord. He's in your hands now, dear Lord. But we ask that you be with his family and friends, dear Lord. Touch him in the only way that you can by bringing peace to their soul. Dear Lord, we always ask those also in Ukraine, dear Lord, although the world is chaotic and this war is going on, we know you're in control of everything. So we pray for peace in that part of the world, dear Lord. And dear Lord, we pray, dear Lord, that all the churches throughout the world, that they mind the same things and speak the same, mind the same rules and speak the same things they, so there won't be no division among us. And dear Lord, in that, this congregation, that we pray that the songs that's going to be sung, the prayers that's going to be lifted up, the communion, the collection, and the message that's going to be delivered, dear Lord, Pray that all these acts of services be pleased and accepted in your sight, dear Lord. We ask this prayer in your son, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brother Hutchinson. Thank you for having me back. Um, today's uh, opening song is going to be page 895, and that's going to be... I'll be I'll live in glory, page eight ninety five. Everybody has it. I'd like to stay here longer than man's allotted days and watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways. 
But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high, I'll live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory, live in glory by and by. I'll tell and sing love story there on high. There with my dear Redeemer, there's no more to die. Oh, yes, I live in glory by and by. I want to be a service along this pilgrim way and lead the lost to Jesus as fervently I pray. As day by day I travel, I'll keep him ever nigh and live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory, live in glory by and by. I'll tell and sing love stories, tell them there on high. There with my dear Redeemer, there's no more to die. Oh, yes, I live in glory by and by. The end I know is nearing, by faith I look away. To yonder home supernal, the land of endless day, I'll cling to him forever and look beyond the sky and live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory, live in glory by and by. I'll tell and sing love story there on high there with my dear redeemer there no more to die oh yes i live in glory by and by amen let's turn to page 535 page 535 we're gonna be singing let me get there there we go on the glory land way page 535 we know that one, right? I, I gotta make sure. <laughs> I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way groweth clearer for I'm in the glory land way. List to the call, the gospel call today. Get in the glory land way. Wonders come home, oh, hasten to obey. For I'm in the glory land way. Well, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way groweth clearer for. I'm in the glory land way. Onward I go rejoicing in his love. I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him in that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. Well, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way groweth 
clearer for I'm in the glory land way. Whoa, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way growing clearer for I'm in the glory land way. You guys sound real good. <laughs> page 324, the song of for communion, page 324. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. And did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred hand? For such a one as I At the cross, at the cross Where I first saw the light And the burdens of my heart Rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Well, my the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When Christ the mighty maker died for man, the creature sinned. It was at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. As we take pause in our singing, honoring our Savior, I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23. And it reads, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night he, in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. We'll now have Brother Dave uh, bless the bread. Father God, we come to you at this moment, dear God, thanking you, first of all, for having us here at this place, may be able to sing praises to your name, Father. We ask that you bless this bread that represents your body that was crucified for our own sins, Father. May we remember the sacrifice uh, with our hearts open, Father, recognizing the love that you have for each and every one of us. We ask that you bless this bread and you bless each and every one of us as we partake of this. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
And it goes on to read, verse 25, After the same manner he also took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. At this time we'll have our brother Keith bless the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come here to have this communion to commemorate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for what he did on the cross and shed his blood for us to cleanse us from all sin. We give thanks and we thank you in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Verse 26 reads, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. Also let him eat that bread, drink and drink of that cup, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep at this time let us commune first peter chapter 1 verse 9 Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in, in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Wherefore, Gird up, the, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the re revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as which have called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work past the time of your sojourning here in fear, Was anyone missed? This concludes the Lord's Supper. Luke chapter 3, verse 11 reads, He replied to them, The one who has two shirts must share with someone who has none. And the one who has food must do the same. At this time, let us give back.
Let us pray. Heavenly, most gracious Father, Lord, we ask that you bless the offerings, Heavenly Father, that was received. And Heavenly Father, we pray that it's pleasing to you that we would use these funds, Heavenly Father, to continue the Lord's services here at East Palomar, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we thank those that were able to give and those that were not able to give this time but may give another appointed, appointed time, Heavenly Father. Again, we just thank you so much, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray and the things we give. Amen. Amen. I don't think there's a number for it, but we're going to sing Still Have Joy. Still have joy, you know I still have joy. After all the things I've been through, Lord, I still have joy. Sing it over, I still have joy. You know I still have joy. After all the things I've been through, Lord, I still have joy, still have peace. Still have peace, still have peace. After all the things I've been through, y'all, I still have, still have love. You know I still have love, and after all the things I've been through, all I still have, still have faith, I still have faith. You know I still have faith, and after all the things I've been through, church, I still have faith, still have hope, still have Hope. You know I still have hope, and after all the things I've been through, y'all, I still have hope, still have joy, still have joy. You know I still have joy, after all the things I've been through, y'all, I still have joy sing it over i still have joy you know i still have joy after all the things i've been through y'all i still have joy all right let us stand and this is going to be the song before the sermon and actually for the song following the sermon we're actually gonna go ahead and mark uh number page 959, page 959 for the song after the sermon. Actually, actually, we're actually going to sing that right now. I'll give you the song after the sermon when we get there. <laughs> All right, we're going to sing 959, Just a Little Talk with Jesus. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It bathed my heart in love and wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our faintest cry. Answer by and by. Now when you feel a little prayer for yearning, heart to heaven is turning. You will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right all right sometimes my past seems drear without a ray of cheer and then a little cloud of doubt may hide the day the mist of sin may rise and hide the starry skies but just a little talk with Jesus clears the way now let us 
us have a little talk with him. Let us tell him all about our troubles. Hear our faintest cry and he will survive him. Now when you feel a little prayer for as your heart to heaven is and if you do you will find a little talk with jesus makes it right all right i may have doubts and fears my eyes be filled with tears but jesus is a friend who watches day and night I go to him in prayers, and he knows my every care. And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. All right, now let us. We could just take that on to the next week, Lord. <laughs> Have a little talk with Jesus. Amen. Good morning, saints. Good morning. Good to see everyone out this morning. My brother, thank you for the beautiful song leading. And I want to thank all the brethren that came out yesterday for our business meeting. We got a lot of stuff accomplished. We're looking at some, some goals that we have set before us right now. And as we mentioned before, one of them is we want to put a roof on the building. We want to put a roof on both buildings, actually. So we are actively working towards that goal. We're going to try to do it you know, this year, if possible. Uh, that is the, the idea behind it. Uh, so we came together and we talked about that. And Lord have mercy, yes, we even talked about Brother Dave getting the baptistry heater fixed. Amen, <laughs> Sister J. Amen. Some people have been being baptized in ice water, Lord have mercy. So we want to try to get that taken care of ASAP. So we got a couple of things on, on our plate, but we cannot allow those things to take away from the spiritual because there's a part of uh, our community that is still dealing uh, a lot with COVID and a lot with just problems and issues and health. So uh, the saints in the area, the saints all over the world, they need encouragement. And so we're looking at some ways that we may be able to do that within the confines of whatever you know, limitations that we have, but we don't have limitations because we serve a what? Powerful God. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. And so we don't worry about that at all. We just have to do our part by obviously making sure that we do whatever we can to do things decently and in order. We had some, oh, it depends on what your per, per, spiritual excuse me, perspective is, but we had some heavy news this week. Our beloved brother, Robert Ahuna, transitioned to be with the Lord. And uh, some of you may remember Brother Robert. He had a thick mustache. Um, excuse me, he worked on the table. He uh, would count uh, in the back the monies. He would do, uh, do security guard duties. He would often open with a prayer, closing with a prayer. He was very quiet. Matter of fact, if you didn't turn around and look, you didn't notice that he was there. But our brother Robert, our beloved brother Robert, uh, passed away. He was a member here of the Palomar Street Church of Christ for well over 20 years, well over. Faithful brother, just very private, but uh, we 
miss him dearly. And we want to pray uh, for the Ahuna family. I talked to his brother Steve. I talked to his sister. We obviously offered uh, to do whatever we can to assist the family. Uh, they are still numb right now. They are still just dealing with the news. And so uh, he gave me his word. He would definitely be reaching out to me uh, probably sometime this week. But uh, that is just something really heavy. It was totally unexpected. Uh, Brother Robert missed uh, this past Sunday, but before that, I think he had been here every single Sunday. And then to get news like that out of the blue, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely something that makes you think, but we are so thankful and grateful to God that he transitioned in the Lord. And uh, it appears, again, the autopsy is not done yet, but it appears that he passed in his sleep. And so we just pray for uh, the Ahuna family. Also, Brother Gerald, uh, Brother Gerald, we want to continue to pray for Brother Gerald. And oh, I don't, I don't want to miss anyone, so I'm just kind of going off of those that are right on the top of my mind. We know that Brother Gerald has been struggling quite heavily with issues with his uh, esophagus, and he has already been through one or two surgeries. He's got another one coming up, and so we definitely want to pray for uh, Brother Gerald. Right now, we're in the Colossian letter. We are in the Colossian letter. And as I was sitting back, I was kind of watching a little bit of the uh, services there for Brother Eugene Lawton in uh, Newark. Uh, they had his service on yesterday. My mind got to thinking, and I think I mentioned to you guys before, uh, earlier in my you know, pastoral journey, or if you want to call that, uh, I received the CD of Brother Eugene Lawton from Brother Kirkendall. And I listened to that thing probably four or five, six, seven times. It was just so so powerful. And I only uh, meant to say that because we need to continue to pray for those that are preaching the gospel. We need to continue to pray. There are so few now. And then the ones that are coming in sometimes are, have all kinds of wild doctrines or charismatics. They're, they're all over the map. And so we just need to pray for all of those that are uh, continuing to preach the gospel during these difficult times. And so we want to pray for them as well. But we're going to look today and I'm going to try to get through Colossians 3, 1 through 17. We are now in the application phase. The first two chapters were doctrinal. The Apostle Paul got notified that these men had ascended on this small enclave in Colossae. And we know that he is in house arrest. And so he writes this beautiful little letter. It's only four chapters. And he begins to encourage the saints that are there in Colossae. These men, these Gnostics that John deals with quite heavily in his letters first show up here in Colossae. And it's one of the first great heresies of the first century church. And they were dealing with the essence of Christ and the worshiping of angels, a mix of asceticism which is denying your body of certain things. They, they, they believed that matter was evil, that you could do anything in your fleshly body because it didn't matter. But then they were mixed with uh, mysticism, uh, some forms of uh, Judaism with the law, and then Greek philosophy. And so they just kind of put all this stuff in a bag and shook it up. And then they felt that they were intellectually and spiritually higher than the common man. That if you wanted to know anything about God, if you wanted to know the essence of God, if you wanted to know how you live your life, you had to come to them because they had, quote unquote, the secrets. They had a secret knowledge. And in this teaching and in this way of life that they were trying to institute people going back up under the law and new moons and Sabbaths and holy days and all the various rituals that we find in the law, they were taking what Christ did on the cross and they were bringing it down. They were lowering it. They were taking Christ off of the varsity team and putting him on the JV team. And then they were taking the blood and they were somehow watering it down. They were making the blood as if it was not as powerful as it was. In other words, the blood that covered your sins. So in a way, they were going back to not necessarily uh, uh, 
straying away from our obedience, because we obviously have obedience, but they were trying to make it as if Christ's sacrifice is not the way to salvation, but the salvation is through their teaching with, oh, by the way, they're going to mix in a little bit of this Jesus stuff. The Apostle Paul writes to this small letter, this small letter to this small enclave, and the first two chapters is what we've been going through, uh, chapters one and two. And so now in chapter number three, we get to an application phase. Chapter three and chapter four is all application. And so in looking for how we would, would title this, I'm not big on titles, but just so that we could collectively remember what we're going to discuss this morning, I went to the text and looked at set your mind. Some of your Bible versions might say set your affection. But set your mind. Paul said, I've given you this doctrinal stuff. I've given you the nature of Christ Jesus. I've given you the status of your, your salvation. You are now new creatures in Christ, a new, a new man in Christ. Now I want to talk to you about how to live. What do you do with this stuff? You got this information. Now we're putting you back on a, a solid ground as for, in terms of doctrine, in terms of teaching. We are now taking Christ Jesus and we're putting him back on the top of his throne. We're giving the pure blood now. We're understanding the pure blood. Now, what do you do with all this information? That's chapter 3. So he starts off, and we want to look at three areas. We want to look at this change that occurred. And then we want to look at the challenges of the changes. Lord have mercy, because Satan is still around trying to get us. And then thirdly, we want to look at the characteristics so we want to look at the change, the challenge, and the characteristics. This change begins in chapter number 3, verse 1 through 4. And Paul says, if then ye be risen with Christ. This actually is a first-class conditional statement. And it, would, it could also be translated as since. Since then ye be risen as Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, in verse 2, set your affection or set your mind or set your desires on things above and not on things of this earth. Hold on, wait a minute. It's not to say that you cannot aspire for a better life. It's not to say that you cannot work extra hours for your business. It's not to say that you can't take up extra classes at night to try to better your situation. And what it's talking about is the desires where you make these things your God. You make these things, they become your idol, they become your all. You think about them more than you think about God. The Apostle Paul is saying, look, uh, Colossians, we've gone through this before. Now you have a lot of information, so I want you guys to set your affections or set your mind on things above. These heavenly desires. In other words, it kind of asks us the question, if I was going to go back to the Socratic method of teaching that Paul employs so much, he doesn't do it here, but I'm trying to bring that into the, to this discussion right here. It would be, what motivates your life? What really motivates your life? Is it another home? Is it another business? Is it more money in the bank? Is it so that you can go on a third and fourth and fifth trip? Is it so that you can shop at, at, at all types of fancy? What motivates your life? Because, see, if you find out where your heart is, that's where your mind is going to be. And the same goes the opposite way around. If you find out what your mind is, that's where your heart is. See, Apostle Paul is kind of checking them a little bit. He says, wait a minute. Let's get this back in order. Set your mind on things above. Don't worry about the things that are down here on this earth. If you can't get that brand new car, that's okay. If you can't achieve that certain goal that you want to have with your businesses, that's okay. 
If you want to do certain things and you have to delay it for another year, that's okay because your mind is not set on those things. Your mind is set on the things above. In other words, it's like, God, I want to follow you first. I want to follow you second. I want to follow you third. You guide me. And sometimes that goal that I'm chasing after, you may not want me to have it. Because if you give me everything I want, then I might forget about you, Lord. Because now I got too many trips. I got more money than I could think of. I want to go to Dubai. I want to go to New York. I want to go to Paris. I want to go to Jerusalem. Lord, I see you when I see you. But right now, I'm, it's all about me. I'm living my best life right now. So sometimes God knows that. And he says, okay, I'm going to hold on that for a little bit. I'm going to let you wander around the desert a little bit. Because I don't want you to forget about me. I don't want to give you everything that you asked for right when you asked for it. Because next thing you know, I'm not going to see you no more. The Apostle Paul says, set your mind on things which are above. Verse number three. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. I almost wanted to go over to Galatians chapter number 2, verse number 20, but that would just dig a big old pit, and we'd be here all afternoon. He says, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then yet shall ye also appear with him in glory. This speaks to our heavenly deliverance, and sometimes we don't have a picture of what that looks like. You know, we are here, and we are mourning the passing of you know, uh, uh, Brother Robert, and we see our, our brother minister at the Newark Church of Christ, and we see so many people here that we are passing. But sometimes when we set our mind on things that are above, we develop a sense that we're not afraid of death. That's why Paul told him in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, remember the whole chapter 15 is dealing with the resurrection, and at the end he says, O death, where is thy sting? Because he was no longer afraid of what might happen because his faith and his assurance in God was so powerful and so complete that death didn't fear him. That's not to say he's going to walk out in front of a truck. That's not going to say he's going to not flee or avoid problems or obstacles. We still must use some common sense. But what he was saying is when my time comes, when my day, when my number is up, I'm going to be in glory. I know where my destination is. I know where my life is. I'm going to be with Christ. That's why when we go back to the Galatians letter, he says, I'm caught between the two. He says, I want to stay with you for the furtherance of the gospel, but I'm ready. I'm ready to go and be with the Lord. That's why we use the analogy there for those that um, uh, remember uh, the, uh, the movie. What's the movie with the, um, Willy Wonka? Y'all just hold on with Brother Williams for a minute. That one scene where they're going through the long tunnel and it gets smaller and smaller. Y'all remember that scene? Come on, y'all, help a preacher out. I always, when I go to that text in Galatians 2, I think of that because what Paul was saying is as he's walking up that tunnel, these two walls are getting closer. One wall is to go be with Christ, and the other wall is to stay and continue for the furtherance of the gospel. And he's walking, and he's going through problems and issues and struggles. And if whichever wall he touches, Brother Dave, that's the one he's going to go to. He said, I'm ready for that. I'm ready for either wall that touches that I touch first. I'm ready for either one. He said, but for your sakes, I'm going to stay to continue to preach the good news of the gospel. Why? Because we are going through problems and issues in our lives, and sometimes we need to hear that good news. We need somebody to remind us of what God has done and what he continues to do for us each and every day. So this heavenly destiny is something that we certainly keep in our mind and we understand what God has done and is continuing to do. And we begin to look into verse 5 through 11. We start to talk about the challenges. Paul saying, okay, Colossians, you've got this information, but you're still going to have some issues. You're still going to have some problems, and these problems are going to affect your life, and you need to be able to walk and navigate 
through all the issues that are going to continue to face you. So he says in verse number five, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Mortify. It, it's, it's a medical term. The Apostle Paul is speaking as if it was a mortician. These things that used to guide you, these things that used to control you, these things that used to uh, uh, really upset you or were so heavily ingrained in your life that you were always walking around mad. Me and Brother Keith were coming in this morning, and we saw a young lady, Brother Dave, looked like she was in her 20-something. She was 20-something walking her dog, and she just had a scowl on her face. Just a scowl. I mean, she wasn't scowling at us, but she just looked so unhappy with life. Just looked like she had a million problems. Those things, those challenges affect Christians. That doesn't mean that you're not a Christian, doesn't mean that you're not perfect, but sometimes these challenges get to us. Sometimes you have a bad morning. Sometimes somebody gets on your very last nerve, Lord have mercy. Sometimes you just get some feeling in you, in, in you that you want to lash out at someone. But these are the things that the Apostle Paul is saying is when you set your mind, when you set your affections, not that these things aren't going to continue to happen, but you're so much better prepared for them. Because now the song that we sing, Count Your Blessings One by One, it's not just a song anymore. You, surely, you literally think about your life and where God has you and what he's doing for you, and you look at the person like that young lady today, and you almost just feel bad for him. You want to pray for them. Because even though you're driving a little bucket, even though the heat's not working in your house, even though you got two pieces of bread in your cupboard, you know that God has got your back. So it allows you to mortify your body in these circumstances. Verse 6, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. I'm not going to spend too much time there, brethren, but that's a whole sermon in and of itself. I would go over to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1, verse 7 and 8. I would go to many places. I would go to Romans chapter 1, verse 19 to 21. There's so many places that talks about the other shoe of God. And if you go into Romans 12, 19 through 21, uh, where, where, where Paul tells us through, through the Holy Spirit, uh, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, leave room for wrath, I shall repay. That text right there. When you go into that text and you look at vengeance and wrath or anger and wrath, the Greek word there, as we talked on Wednesday, is thumos. It's where we get the word thumometer. Those two words are used approximately 128 times together in Scripture. In other words, there is enough anecdotal evidence for you and I to know that God does not like disobedience. There is a price to pay. We consider it in biblical terms as the wages of sin, the payment of sin, what God is going to do when he encounters sin. This is why we have to have Christ Jesus on us and put on the whole armor of God as we go through this life, brethren. We go through this life. Y'all need to walk around here looking like Iron Man, Lord have mercy, with the light on and the, the helmet, the whole thing. I know I'm being a little uh, comical here, but the point is serious. Satan is going to continue to come after you. In fact, when you give your life over to Christ Jesus and you try to walk worthy of the vocation that you are called in Ephesians chapter number four, verse number one, he's coming at you harder. He's coming at you more frequently. And what he does, he kind of probes, you know, like, like uh, computer viruses. When they put the virus, the, the virus just keeps pinging, looking for weaknesses, and, and it keeps going, Brother David, until it can find a way to get into your system. That's how Satan is. He's just going to keep probing. He's going to hit in all spots. And off, if you're shielded in, all, in 14 of those spots, he's going to try another 14. He said, okay, this person has a comfortable living. Can't get him with that. They have a decent family. I can't get them with that. God has blessed them with some physical health. I can't get them with that. They have a modest, a modest income. I can't get them with that. He says, okay, let me, let me do the job on them. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Let me touch the physical body. 
Let me start have some stuff come up and grow in you. And all of a sudden, that comfort level that you once had, you realize that Satan was probing until he found a weakness. And next you know your whole life is shattered. This is why, brethren, we continue to have faith and trust in Christ Jesus and know, again, where our final destiny is, no matter what situation befalls us. Let's go on, brethren, for the sake of time. Let's start looking at verse uh, number uh, uh, 8 and 9. In 8 and 9, the Apostle Paul talks about social sins. He's talking about social sins, and he's also going to talk about uh, internal sins, or I'm sorry, external sins. When we look at social sins, brother, verse uh, 8, but now ye also put off all these things. Anger. Notice he's not talking doctrine no more. Anger. Wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, not lying to one another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. One of the saddest commentaries on the church is where we have been in the Lord's church for 950 years, and we still stumbling over stuff we stumbled when we first got baptized. There's a man I know, no, don't worry about it, it's not Palomar, it's not even in San Diego, but you know, I converse with him from time to time. He claims to be a Christian. He's arrogant, he's a potty mouth, He's vindictive. He's got all this stuff. Anger, malice. I'm going to get him back. But he claims to be a Christian. Where we're at in the Colossian letter, Paul is telling us it's time to take off the training wheels. I've taught you the doctrine in chapter 1 and 2. Now we want to apply it for our life. Brother, I don't care if you've been in the church since Noah Dr. Ark. You ought not have the same stumbles that you had 29 years ago. Somewhere you missed 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 7. God did not give us a spirit of fear. But what? Of power, of what? Love, and what's the third piece? A sound mind. Wait a minute, brother. Some version will say self-control. If you had your mind, I'm not criticizing him or trying to single him out. We're just talking generically. But if your mind was set on things above, and you have a foundation of what Christ has done and what that means, then there ought to be some change in your life. There ought to be some modicum of difference being made. As the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter number 11, uh, verse number 6, I think, which is probably the crux of the whole uh, Hebrew letter. See, no, Hebrews chapter 6, I'm sorry, verse 1 and 2. He says, uh, progressing towards maturity. Progressing towards maturity. This is spiritually growing up. This is where you take the training wheels off. And people, you don't have to advertise you're a Christian. People just look at you and say, wait a minute, something's different. Some, 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 something's different with this person. You become a walking billboard for the Lord just by the way you live your life and you conduct yourself in a normal fashion. So for the sake of time, I want to now go into uh, chapter uh, Three, first let's finish off verse 10 and 11. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. I don't care if you are a Hebrew Israelite, 
I don't care if you are from some strict sect of Judaism. I don't care what your religious background or doctrine in is. But when you are in Christ, it doesn't matter whether you're black, you're white, you were born in the Philippines, you were born in, in, in Mexico, you speak Tagalog, none of that matters. What matters is Christ is now got you in the fold, in the body of Christ. And you have some people that are going around right now today that are trying to say that only uh, blacks, Hispanics, and Mexicans are going to be saved. That is doctrine from devils. Y'all hear that? And young people are falling for this mess because there's a search for identity. I don't want to get too far into that, but they're searching for identity. They're looking at their lives. They're looking at historical records, and they find some obscure verse, and they try to make that as if that that's the true gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is false doctrine 101. But that's what's going on right now in this country. There is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free. But Christ is all and in all. And, and if we wanted to just go and give an example of that, you guys remember uh, the lesson we did in Acts chapter number, I believe it's 18, uh, belief of the barbars. Paul ended up after the, 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 the shipwreck uh, uh, ended up on an island of barbarians and ended up converting them to the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's go on, brethren. Verse number 12. Verse number 12 starts off and it says, put on, therefore. In other words, the Apostle Paul went through the doctrine in chapter 1 and 2, verse number 20. He kind of brushed us up a little bit leading up to verse number 12. Now he's saying there's something we ought to do. There's something the Colossians ought to do. There's, there's, there's a change in their life, a change in this new life. Now that we've mortified these old things, now that that old man is dead, now that they have a, a foundation, a solid foundation in Christ Jesus, there ought to be something that I do. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. In other words, he's singling out a group of brethren, singling out and says, put on as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercy. That's King James language. That just means go deep. Go all the way down as deep as you can and look for the mercy that is there and pull that mercy up and walk in it. No matter what somebody does, no matter what somebody says, and we know that it's very hard to forgive someone seven times 70. We know it's very hard to always show grace to people. We know it's hard when sometimes we see people and we know they're messing up. We know they're doing things wrong. But then we still have those bowels of mercy. Put on those bowels of mercy. Kindness. Being humble, humble of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Lord, have mercy. If we just practice what's in the word of God, you will be able to change so many lives. Some of us that are breaking up, we won't break up. Some of us that are always mad, we won't be always mad. Some of us that are struggling with things, we'll be able to uh, uh, put it in perspective, and all the people in our circle will say, wait a minute, if this was me, I would do X, and this was me, I would do Y, if this was me, I would do Z, but they see how you handle it, and they say, wait a minute, I'm learning something. Without you taking them to Bible studies, without you whacking them over the head with the Bible, they're learning how it is to walk in a godly fashion. The problem that a lot of people have with coming to church today in a modern setting, and they feel that as soon as they walk in, everybody in the building is going to judge them. That's why in the series that we're starting uh, on Wednesday nights, we're talking about the family, and we're making sure to include our single mothers. We're making sure to include our single fathers. 
because some of them just stay away because they don't want to be judged because they may have several kids and have different fathers. I mean, we understand the dynamics of that. We're not saying that that's right, but we're not trying to beat them up either. We want to bring them in so they can help change them, uh, uh, teach them children so they can have some godly fear in their life. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. In other words, going back over to the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter number 5, verse 19 through uh, 25. Forbearing one another. Forbearing one another. Sometimes it's hard to deal with folk. I don't got one amen on that. And you know how sometimes church folk can get? I'll say amen, Walls. Sometimes we can be tough to get along with. Sometimes we can get a little territorial. Sometimes we can get a little bit where we're just holding on to things and we're doing it out of the best interest of the wider body, but we're not doing it with the inclusion of the wider body. We get little kingdoms, we get little fiefdoms, we get little areas of where we are in control or have power and we let it go to our heads and then all of a sudden we're not really acting in the, in the best interest of the church, we're acting in the best interest of what I think. Amen, somebody. We have to be aware of ourselves. That is why the Apostle Paul says, walk in hum- uh, uh, humility or humbleness of mind. And I'm talking about preachers. Because preachers sometimes can be some of the worst offenders. Not trusting brethren, not working with the sisters, not working with people within the wider body of Christ and always thinking they got all the answers. That's not to say that God hasn't put you in a position position or there's some responsibility that comes with that position, but you have to work with the brethren. That's how the church functions. That's how the church was designed to function. There's only one head of the church, and that's Christ. That is Christ Jesus. Let me keep going, brethren. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also ye. Brother Dave, we could have built a whole campground. I remember when I was growing up, they used to have the Winnebago's. Y'all remember the Winnebago, the, 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 uh, the, the trailers? We could build a campground right there on the second half of verse 13 in forgiving people. But let's move on to verse 14. Because there Paul says, above all, that's all good. Everything that we talk about, that's all good. But above all, put on charity or love which is the bond of perfectness. We have a sermon on this one. We did a sermon called The Bond of Perfectness, and we tried to imagine what that really looks like. It's like when you put your pants or your trousers on, and no matter how you do it, they just kind of sag and they're not fitting right. But you know, as soon as you put a belt on and tighten it a little bit, it just gets right in in order. Love is that belt. It acts as a bond. It brings everything in your life together. It is the bond of perfectness. When you are truly walking in love, when you are truly understanding love, and the love is vertical and it is horizontal, when you truly understand love and how God sacrificed because he loved me and you, especially me, Lord have mercy, not not making it about me, but I took the dirt road to Christ Jesus. When you understand the love and what he has given to you freely, it affects you in a way that you didn't really know you could be affected in that way. It's kind of like a, a, a parent that sees their first child, you're in the operating room, and you see the child's face for the very first time. You knew the child was coming. 
You rushed to the hospital. You got the scrubs on. You're sitting in there with the doctors and nurses. But something, when you first see the child, before they even clean it, when you see that child, it changes you. It's like, wow, just like a minute or two of just astonishment at the beauty that created, that God created, and now has given to you for you to be as responsible for that feeling of love, that bond, it changes your life. Then all of a sudden, as soon as you get home, nah, man, I can't go to the club tonight, man. I'm going with, the, I'm going with, 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 with mom and the baby. No, nah, I can't do this. I can't do that. I got to take care of my son. I got to take care of my daughter. Why? Because now you have been changed. That bond of perfect, that perfectness has affected you in a way. But we're looking at it from a parental perspective, but we're trying to expand our thinking to look at it from a godly perspective. When that bond of perfectness hits you, it don't matter all these other things. Because your mind, your affection is set on things above. I don't need nobody to tell me what time church start. <laughs> oh, y'all should have said amen and started jumping and shouting. You don't need a law is where I was going. You don't need somebody banging you across the head to tell you to get up and come worship the Lord. Because that bond of affection is, that is now expanded, you see and you understand, you said, okay, now I have a duty. Amen. I have a responsibility. Even if I'm not feeling well, there might be somebody in church that day that's going through something really bad. And the fact that they saw me and I hugged them or we hugged and whatever the case might be, it might just cheer them up and help them get through that one day. That's the bond of perfection. It's the bond of perfectness. You didn't even know that you had an impact on a person's life, but they were just so glad to see you. So glad to worship with you. So glad to hear the beautiful songs. So glad to hear a word from the Lord, that bond of perfectness that continues to perpetuate in our lives, brethren. The Apostle Paul has moved into the application phase, and he's telling these Colossian people, look, don't worry about them Gnostics. Y'all start living your life. Live your life the way God would have you to live your life, and everything is going to be all right. That's basically what he's saying. Verse 15. Let's see if he's saying that. And let the peace of God, Lord have mercy, that's just exactly what he's saying. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. The peace of God. The peace of God. I'm slowing down on purpose, brethren. The peace of God. What does that mean? What does it look like? What does it feel like? The peace of God. Where now I'm in a space spiritually. Where I, 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 got, I got these other things that are going on. I, I got some tension in my life. I have some problems with my children. But there's a peace with God where I'm able to go to him in prayer. I'm able to rejoice at the past victories that he's given to me. I'm able to look. I'm, I'm using myself, but I'm, I'm talking about all of it. We are able to look at where he's taking us. He's brought us from a place, but he's taking us somewhere else. It creates a peace. It creates a calmness. It creates an attitude in your mind where there is a certain level of comfort during a storm. Where I'm not frustrated. I still have to deal with A, B, and C, but the peace of God now rules my mind. It's now governing my thoughts, my walk, 
everything. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which ye are also called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Verse 17. And whatsoever you do, and I wish we had time, we might pick up this up on next week because some people say whatsoever, they just think that's whatsoever. <laughs> Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And we begin to see clearly where the Apostle Paul has transitioned in this letter, and he is encouraging the Colossians to take the training wheels off. Learn how to ride this bicycle. And I'll just say this as we wrap up for those that may not have been here, but I tell the story of how my father, who's passed now, um, taught me how to ride a bicycle. My father passed. He had his own, his own demons, his own problems. He was here in the 30s and about, I would say, the 40s and 50s. He was an officer in the Navy, and he ended up dying of cirrhosis of the liver. That means, basically, he drank himself to death. And during that time in our country, him being an African-American man in the, in the military and an officer at that, I can't imagine the things that he was going through. I remember my father coming and him and my mother having a argument in the kitchen. And I was probably six or seven, I don't remember. But mom was God-fearing. And pop was a good man, but he had a problem. And he had the nerve to come over inebriated completely drunk. Mom was so mad at him. They were arguing. I tried to step in between, but I'm only four foot tall. And he was trying to come to mom, and she finally pushed him. And the reason it's so vivid is because he stumbled, Brother Jim. It took him 15 minutes to fall. <laughs> I'm saying that because when you give your life over to Christ, you never know what situation you were in and where God can be leading you to. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. Don't worry about that little piece of car that you have, and you've been having it since 1929. <laughs> and we all know you want a new one, and you're trying, and that's good. Keep on trying. But keep your affection, set your mind on things above and not on the things of this earth. If you are here today, brethren, you come to our Lord and Savior by hearing the gospel message. What is the gospel? The gospel could be defined as simply good news, generic. But in Romans 1, 16 and 17, the apostle Paul, Brother Dave, he narrows it. He, he defines it. He said the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. That's in your Bible. The good news of Jesus Christ, what he did, why he was sent, what he went through, how he spent all that time on the cross 
and he was whipped and whipped and spit upon with the cat of nine tails. Just imagine the blood. Just imagine what his face looks like. Just imagine his skin and flesh coming off of his body. Just imagine the smell. Just imagine the horror of the people that are around watching this young, strong Roman soldier just lash and lash and lash and lash and lash again and lash again and lash again and lash again and lash again. And visualize if you could physically pick up the cat of nine tails, which was a piece of wood with long leather straps. And at the end of the leather strap, it was rocks and pieces of uh, 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 metal and different kind of hooks and grabbing tools. And that young Roman soldier would stand about 10 feet away from you and just whip you till he gets tired. That's what Christ went through. That's the picture of him that we see when he died for you and I. And that visualization, that understanding that he did that for you while you were still in your sins. You didn't even know him. You wasn't paying attention to him. You you had no affection towards him. He did that for you and me. Once we internalize that gospel, we hear about that gospel message. Then we believe that gospel message. Then we repent of our sins, which is teshuva in the Hebrew, which simply means to turn. Just turn away from your sins, that old life. Like the Bible tells us that Job eschewed evil. Job, Job avoided evil. Job got away from evil. You hear that gospel message. You believe that gospel message. You repent of your sins. You confess Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 10, verse 30, number 32. You all should highlight that in your Bibles. If you don't confess me before men, I will not go before the God of the universe and confess you. That most noble confession, that most noble confession of who Jesus is. And then you have that obedient faith where you are buried in the liquid tomb of baptism. Paul deals with that in Colossians 2. He also deals with that in Romans chapter number 6. And then here, as he's showing us here, that you are then raised in the newness of life. You're not perfect. We're not perfect. I'm not perfect. But you're raised in a newness of life where you have this peace with God, you have this understanding, and you are walking by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, again, uh, not to belabor this, but the Holy Spirit does not make zombies. That is a false doctrine. Some people believe that the Holy Spirit just comes and you are a perfect person from that point. No, sir, no, ma'am. You still have free will. You can go out there and get you a bourbon. You can go out there and smoke a joint, whatever. You still have free will. What I'm saying is not that you would do those things, but that your walk with God in Christ must be because you have set your mind and the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truths. And then Romans chapter number... Two, the writer tells us there to be faithful unto death. There were some people back in the days of the persecution that would rather give up their faith in God and pinch the salt or the ashes and confess Caesar than to continue to confess the Lord Jesus. We are faithful unto death. If you are here today, brethren, and you have not given your life over to Christ Jesus, we have told you what to do, or what needs to be done, and now it is up to you. You have a decision to make, as Joshua said in Joshua chapter number, um, I think it's 24, yes, Joshua 24, the verse is number 15. He says, as for me and my house, we're going to follow the Lord. So if this is you, brethren, and you have that desire in your heart, please remain standing as we sing the song of invitation.
You know, other, I do have a prayer request card here from Brother Carmen Evans. He's asking us to pray for his daughter and his cousin and a friend as uh, they come down from Big Bear. So, uh, uh, requesting uh, traveling grace for Brittany and Shauna and the friend. I don't have uh, any other visitors' cards, but however, we want to just thank Brother Darrell for that lesson in which he had brought today. And giving us some things, some meat to chew on and to eat and to, uh, to, to digest there. And so we pray that uh, you have uh, learned something from today's lesson, something that uh, caused you to look inward at your lives and caused you to examine yourselves so that as we walk through this Christian uh, walk here on this earth, that we become the Christians that God would want us to be. Yeah. At this time, uh, we will have a uh, closing song and we'll come back and have our prayer uh, for uh, those who have requested prayers in the, at the time. Page 610, I love my Savior too. So I'll stand. Jesus, my heavenly King, loves me, I know. Praises to him I sing, onward I go. Closely to him I cling, blessing still flow. I love my Savior too. You know that I love my Savior. He loves me too. I see his favor in everything I do. Happy to serve my friend, lean on his arm. Rapture will never end, nothing alarm. Voices will sweetly blend under his charm. I love my Savior too. I love my Savior. He loves me too. I seek His favor in everything I do. You know that I love my Savior. He loves me too. Yes, he loves me too. Oh, I see his favor in everything I do. Before we go into our prayer, we want to thank Brother uh, Javon Hutchinson. You know, he just came and visited us last week. I asked him, what does he do in the church? He says, everything. I said, okay, well, did you want to sing? And, and, and he stood up to the call. Being a young man in God's kingdom, Amen. he stood up Amen. to the call. And so we want to encourage him, but encourage all of our young to uh, stand up for Christ. Amen. Let us work in his vineyard. So shall we pray? Dimly Father, we come at this time. We give you thanks for this day. We thank you, Dimly Father, for the message that we heard from your manservant today, Dimly Father. And we pray that if we found that that word has pricked us in our hearts, Dimly Father, that it has pricked us to the point that caused us to change, Dimly Father, caused us to look at our lives, Dimly Father, where we're going, and to give our lives back unto you, Dimly Father. But we also pray, Dimly Father, for those of us that that word has edified us. 
as we walk on this world, dear Heavenly Father, here and through the struggles and trials that we've gone through, dear Heavenly Father, to know that you are with us, dear Heavenly Father, to know that you care for us, that you love us, dear Heavenly Father. And we pray, dear Heavenly Father, that we, as your children, may be able to let our light shine, dear Heavenly Father, to this dying and perishing world, yet to each and every last one of our brothers and sisters, dear Heavenly Father, that we may have the brotherly love for all mankind, dear Heavenly Father, because we understand that it is your will that no man should perish, dear Heavenly Father. But we pray, dear Heavenly Father, that they will come unto you before it's everlasting too late. We ask, dear Heavenly Father, uh, that you will be with uh, Sister Stinson as she has requested prayers. Her mother's surgery uh, has gone well and that she has health issues, dear Heavenly Father. And we understand that her sister had a stroke. And we know, dear Heavenly Father, how our worrying can take a toll on our body. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that she may be able to, uh, Sister Stinson may be able to work with her mother and let her know, let us to put the trust in you, dear Heavenly Father. We may not understand, dear Heavenly Father, your ways of why you do things the way that you do, but we do know, dear Heavenly Father, that you are faithful, dear Heavenly Father. And we just pray that we may be encouraged by that, that Sister Stinson may be encouraged by that also, dear Heavenly Father. Amen. And we pray, dear Heavenly Father, for Brother Carmen and his request for his daughter and the friends, that dear Heavenly Father, if it be your will, that they may return home safely without any harm or danger, dear Heavenly Father, before them. And we pray, dear Heavenly Father, now as we get ready and prepare to depart, dear Heavenly Father, until the next meeting time, that you'd watch over us, dear Heavenly Father, that you keep us safe until that next appointed time. This is our prayer in your son Jesus' name. We do give thanks and praise. Amen. Amen.